In today's panel, uh, we'll be talking about Rubbish Bay from Lapsap Wan to the marine litter problem in Hong Kong. And we're very happy today to have three panelists. Um, we have Tracy Reed, uh, founder and CEO of Plastic Free Seas. Um, Patrick Young, project manager of the Coastal Watch project of WWF. And Mandy Barker, our finalist of Wingmasters Award this year. You can see her works, her beautiful works hanging right over there. So um, I'll hand over to our panelists today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I better escape from this seat. <laughs> yeah, so uh, my name is Patrick. I'm from WWF, and so um, recently we uh, we have been to Lapsat Wan, a bay area in southern side of Hong Kong Island, which is amazing. So I we, we would like just like to show you how it it uh, um, is it looks like, and then um, so I will introduce to you the case study that we conducted in Lapsat Wan, and then Tracy will talk about the general problem uh, of marine litter in Hong Kong. And then Mandy will talk about the artistic <laughs> part of this. Yep. So I don't know if anyone has uh, heard of Lapsat One. Have, if if yes, please raise your hand. Oh, many of you. So how many of you have been there? Oh, just three. Okay. So maybe the scenes will shock you later on. So um, firstly, um, I'd just like to tell you guys about um, Lapsat One. So actually in Hong Kong, there are there have been five Lapsat Ones. And so uh, there is a Gin Drinkers Bay around Kwai Chong, Belcher Bay around uh, Kennedy Town, Sai Chou Wan uh, around uh, Kun Tong, Junk Bay, as his name tells, and then Lapsat One. So these four uh, so-called Lapsat One, the, the uh, rubbish space, has been reclaimed already. So what's left is this Lapsat One. So I will show you more about this. So this is the uh, southern side, at uh, southeastern tip of um, Hong Kong Island, which is called Capdegula. And over here, you can see this bay is Lapsat One. And all around here are actually quite rural. You don't see a lot of buildings, no housings, uh, only have, oops, can we see anything? Well, anyway, let me go. just go back to the previous one. It, it looks all right in my computer. <laughs> yeah, so around here, we have some small villages uh, called uh, Hock Choi Village, and then in here, it is the uh, Capdagula Marine Reserve, which is uh, a completely uh, fishing band, and, uh, and all recreational activities is prohibited in this area. And there is the uh, Marine Science Laboratory of uh, University of Hong Kong called the, the SWIMS, and also a radio uh, uh, station of PCCW here. So actually, around this area, there is virtually no um, human activity uh, which affects this beach, except um, there may be occasionally some hikers walking around, but because this beach, this beach is uh, inaccessible to uh, pedestrian, so actually I think um, maybe each year there may be only like 10 people who visit this bay, but uh, uh, the condition there will shock you. And actually, um, uh, Lapsa One is located here, and we can see a red dot here. So this is actually the report uh, from the government, uh, which is released recently on last, last Friday. Um, so the report is about the marine litter, marine litter problem in Hong Kong, and it identifies um, the different um, locations which need special care by the different government uh, authorities. And uh, the red dots uh, indicate the class one, which is the high con which are the high concern sites. So Lapsa one is actually high concern site. And so this is how it looks like, although I don't know why it doesn't look good in this projector. But anyway, so you can see that 
uh, this Lapsa one is full of all kinds of litter, and um, and this photo was actually taken in 1995, so it's 20 years ago. So maybe 20 years ago, the government was not too aware of this issue, so it was uh, it looks like this before. How about now? So recently, we went to Lapsa one. Oh, Ross is laughing. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> 20 years I've been aware of this problem and it's getting bigger and it seems that they've been ignoring it for 20 years. Oh, you are, you are like a, my good friend who <laughs> helped me tell all the truth, yeah. So actually, I can show you again. This is 20 years ago. This is 20, uh, after 20 years, that is now. So uh, we have observed that it seems that the, the litter just accumulates even for thicker layer now. And moreover, we can see more white stuff, although the, the contrast is not too good in this projector, but they are all the uh, polystyrene stuff. But 20 years ago, maybe more of them are the woods and plastic items. So what actually happens there, which causes this issue to happen? And uh, so we have make, made reference to the government's report, which I just shown you. And actually, uh, there are different factors affecting the, the marine litter deposition in Hong Kong. Namely, the coastal currents, which uh, runs from the southwestern side to northeastern side of Hong Kong. And then the tidal currents going back and forth every day. And during the dry season, the, the direction of the coastal currents um, is the reverse. It comes from the northeastern side to southwestern side. So um, this is one of the factors. And another one is the uh, prevailing wind, especially the, the monsoon wind. And so during the wet season, it is quite uh, coherent with the coastal current. It comes from the south to the north. And during the winter, it mainly comes from the east to northeast. So according to this, um, uh, the consultancy report about the marine litter problem identifies um, the, the hot spots, which are eff more affected by the uh, prevailing wind. So um, during the wet season, there are different parts of Hong Kong which are more uh, affected by um, the marine litter, which includes mainly the southwestern side of Hong Kong uh, or anywhere which faces the southwestern side. And that in actually includes um, Lapsa 1 located here, maybe because um, even though it's wet season, but sometimes it has the prevailing wind from the east, so it is affected. But on the other hand, during the dry season, it is one of the hotspots again. So it is quite a sad story about Lapsa 1 because over the whole year, it is more affected. So this is how it looks like when um, the wind comes from the east. So the wave is very strong. It blows every, everything uh, from the sea towards the beach. And uh, all over the beach, we, you can see all the litter. And this is uh, some close-up photos of uh, what's happening in Lapsat 1. So you can see every different items that you can find maybe at, at your home. Or um, if, you go, if you like fishing, if you have entered a fishing boat, you can, you can actually identify some fishing gears, the buoys, and all the different uh, plastic bottles, a cup noodle, and... Um, what else? Oil bottles, um, even industrial waste like this one, which is um, from the uh, from the sandal making factory. Yeah, all all sorts of stuff. And this is uh, <laughs> our friend from Wayne Foundation, and he his, he was uh, my model for this photo. So you can actually see that some 
<laughs> yeah, in some areas, the litter actually piled up even taller than a than an adult, and he's he has a very sad face. <laughs> yeah, he thought he is the tallest man in the world, and we found a bottle. Can you guess what's special with this bottle of Coca-Cola? Anyone? Just guess. Hasn't been opened? Nope. It is drink for. Oh, really old? Not really. From America. I don't know. Well, let me show you. I have my good model again. Is it working? Oh yeah. Oh, did you see it? Was it too fast? Let me show you again. <laughs> Just play again. Yeah. So it had no bubble at first. Whoa. So it's very fresh indeed. It's not old at all. I don't know if it's from America, but <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So this is what we can find in uh, Lapsat One, and he tries to drink it. No, actually, he just he just smelled it, and he he told me it's very fresh. Actually, yeah, but he didn't dare to to drink it. Maybe someone mixed some other liquid from himself into it. So this is what's happening in Lapsat One, and maybe it can give you some insight. About the marine litter problem in Hong Kong. So, um, in view of this um, very very terrible situation, we tried uh, to do some survey to investigate, uh, like the litter um, amount of litter, and also um, the um, the different composition of the litter, and try to weigh them in order to um, estimate the total amount of litter in here. So uh, after our short um, estimation, we um, found that there were actually um, tens of tons of litter in here. So um, according to some um, government officials, actually it would take like ten thousands of uh, tens of thousands of uh, Hong Kong dollars to clean the whole beach, which is a very large sum of money. So they decided maybe it's not a good time to. To clean it yet, yeah. So it is actually a sad fact for us. And then we have, yeah. So we have uh, noted down some of the um, uh, observation and counted the litter uh, composition. So actually, the the um, most um, dominant uh, items in this um, beach are the polystyrene items, which includes like the fishing items. Or the polystyrene boxes, like from the um, fishing, uh, fishery industry, uh, fish trading industry, or uh, like uh, lunch boxes, etc. And also, we find a lot of bottles, which are very dominant indeed, and actually all sorts of different things. You can see your shoes, maybe, and some sieves and um, ropes, etc. So actually, the the litter are from elsewhere. Because I told you at at the beginning, um, this beach has not been um, visited frequently by people, so they shouldn't be from the recreational activities at this beach, but they are all washed from other places. And what's uh, worse of this case is that we find a lot of these uh, broken parts on different litter. Do you know what they are? No. No. The. No, this is yeah, the straw. This is a straw. But what's happening in here? Hmm? Yeah, right. They have been uh, bitten from by, uh, by different marine animals. Maybe the fish. Maybe the birds. Marine mammals, etc. We we cannot be sure, but we are sure that they are. The bites from marine animals. So we we find a lot of different things with with the fish bites. For example, this straw, this toothpaste, um, noodles, 
you eat the noodles and the fish eat the packaging. And M&Ms, only the tube. And even some cloths. This, this was the trous trousers, a pair of trousers, but we still see some kind of this uh, fish bite marks. So, it sh uh, so what does this indicate to us? Uh, if you recall the case of uh, plastic pallet disaster, uh, ha which happened in uh, 2012, you will know that um, actually there has been a lot of uh, uh, a lot of pallets spilled in the sea, and there were a lot of people who are concerned about the food security at that time because they are afraid that the seafood, um, like the the fish which are maricultured, would have eaten some of the plastic pallets. And if the human being eat them, maybe that would cause some health problem. And indeed, during that time, it was not just a, and yeah, just a guess about the um, the issue, but there were indeed some uh, fish which are from the uh, fish culture area, which actually eats the plastic pellets. And when people from the government or uh, come and check and the fishermen dissect them, they actually find the uh, plastic pellet inside. And actually, um, the plastic pellets or the different plastic items, they may absorb um, the, uh, the different um, organic pollutants uh, from the water. And if the fish or other animals eat them, they may accumulate along the food chain. And then if we human beings eat the uh, top predators, maybe we will suffer from this uh, issue as well. And because I know uh, Tracy will talk more about this, so I'm not going into very detail, but uh, we actually see a lot of items with fish bites or uh, bites from other animals. So um, we do not see a lot of wildlife at Lapsat One. We don't know if it's because of the, the uh, very serious pollution, but we only found, oops, we only found some plastic bunnies, plastic dinosaurs. Maybe they are the only animals which can live there because of the serious pollution. So I want every one of you to evaluate uh, from this issue. What may, have, may you have contributed to this issue? Because even if you haven't been to Lapsa One, actually nobody has been to Lapsa One, I guess. Yeah, but there were a lot of litter in it. So where does the litter come from? And what you, ha you might have done to contribute to this and what you can help to solve this problem. So I will leave this question to you. And uh, Lapsa One is actually not the only case with a lot of litter. We actually also found uh, some uh, serious problem inside some sea caves, which uh, also faces the eastern side of Hong Kong. So maybe the prevailing wind also blows a lot of litter into it. And this is a sea cave in Potoi. And um, the litter actually piled up to like 8 or 10 meters high. Yeah, which is very ridiculous, I guess. So what's the relationship between this litter and you from the city or the fishermen? or the industries, or if you are just a visitor to the beaches or the shore, maybe you have done something wrong also. So I, uh, Plastic Free Seas, and also I guess uh, WMA and Trail Watch would like to seek your attention on this case. And then, um, yeah, so that is about the case in Lapsat One. And so, here, I would like to take a sh sh uh, give you a short break by promoting our project. Yeah, just a little bit because it's also quite related to um, the marine litter problem in Hong Kong. So my project is called uh, Coastal Watch, and we uh, WWF is the organizer, and we have a lot of different uh, partners like Eco Marine, Hong Kong Cleanup, Green Council, uh, Eco Education and Resources Center. Uh, OPCF and also Plastic Free Seas. They are all our partners and we are also supported by Living Lama, Lama Corner, 
Ocean Park and the, uh, and the government departments. So the background of our project is uh, from the um, plastic ballast spill in 2012. So at that time, there were, there were a lot of uh, southern beaches in Hong Kong which are seriously affected by the plastic pallets. But on the other hand, we also um, noticed a lot of um, remote beaches which are seriously affected by marine litter. So the plastic pallet problem, maybe it's just a one-off accident, they can be cleaned up by a lot of uh, thousands or ten thousands of Hong Kong people. But how about the marine litter problem? It is actually a persisting problem. If we continue disposing the litter into the sea, or maybe we are just not aware and let the litter come into the sea, they will uh, persist in the sea or on in, at the shore, which seriously affects the marine wildlife and also um, the safety and health of, of our human being. So we set up the Coastal Watch project in order to collect data um, by asking uh, different uh, sectors of the public to join us for uh, um, collecting data on the marine litter problem in order to find out the sources of marine litter and also to um, suggest uh, possible solutions to the government. And then we also would like to educate the public um, to ask everyone to take positive actions, but not just sit here and listen to us, and that's it. So we have uh, located um, like 27 um, sites all over Hong Kong and uh, collect marine uh, litter data uh, at mangroves, mudflats, sandy shore, rocky shore, and even underwater. Uh, to survey on the coral communities and we also cooperate with the fishermen to collect litter from the coastal waters in order to um, yeah, yeah, just categorize them and sort out the sources of the litter. And um, we conduct two types of surveys. One is the ecological survey by uh, investigating the species uh, that we can find in different sites and then we um, collect the marine litter data on the different types of uh, um, even uh, uh, plastic items, metal, uh, glass, or any types of materials and different sorts of items that we can find in order to uh, find out the sources of the litter. So we have a project website, the coastalwatch.hk, which uh, re we release uh, a lot of uh, news about our project. And also we have a Facebook page. If you have a, your cell phone with you, take it out. I give you 10 seconds to search for Coastal Watch. Okay, time's up. <laughs> yeah, so we share a lot of uh, different interesting news about the marine conservation and also the updates on marine litter all over the world so that, yeah, uh, it is for public education to like help you guys um, know more about our marine environment and what we can do for it. And what's more, uh, we also host uh, different um, seminars. Uh, the upcoming one will be on uh, 3rd of May. If you are interested, please come to the Ocean Seminar again. And uh, over there, we will um, we have invited different people um, to give talks about um, the latest development on clean shorelines by the government officials uh, from EPD. And then uh, my colleague, Samantha Lee, who talks about the conservation of Chinese white dolphins in Hong Kong. And then uh, we also invited an artist uh, to talk about upcycling um, in Hong Kong, which um, she will tell you the tips on up how to upcycle uh, different items by yourselves. Uh, or you can also join their workshops to learn more. And um, as I told you, uh, our project uh, invites different um, groups of people, maybe from NGOs, from universities, secondary schools, or corporates to join us for the surveys. So we will recruit new teams in May to June this year. And then we will have the kickoff ceremony of the next year's activity on say, uh, 27th of June. So uh, if you are interested in our project, um, please come to Oops. Please visit our website or Facebook page in order to get the updates uh, of the recruitment or the seminars and also the, the ceremony. So, 
Um, these are all my sharing today. So I will pass the time to Tracy about yeah, to talk about the general problem in Hong Kong. Thank you everyone for coming this afternoon. Um, just to give you a, a background on Plastic Free Seas, we, our focal um, point is actually education. We do a lot of education in schools on plastic marine pollution, going in and talking to students, helping them with their projects and uh, getting them to understand the issues and also the solutions that everybody can take on. We've also just um, launched a sea classroom on board an ex-fishing trawler, so we'll be taking secondary school students out onto the sea to um, do sea surface trawling for microplastics and uh, um, sorry, which one? Oh, and uh, on sea education. So getting students out of the classroom and into the real world and experiencing um, the fantastic things about Hong Kong and also some of the negatives too. Okay, we've uh, been very lucky over the years to have worked with some fantastic artists. Um, this beach installation was done in 2013 by Lena Klaus and she collects the rubbish off the beach and she transforms it into mandalas and uh, rearranges it into a far more engaging um, picture than just bags and bags of trash. So. This is a great example of, um, of her work and it's very eye-catching. It makes you look at it and when you see, see the, each of the objects, you can start to identify with some of the things in there. So um, plastic cutlery is uh, up in the top corner. A lot of single-use items. Um, we can see the uh, bottle caps, water bottles, cups, a lot of shoes. Um, all sorts of household goods. There's uh, a lot of fishing gear as well. It's a great way to to look at look at rubbish in a different way. And uh, sadly, most of this is actually coming from Hong Kong. A lot of people think that all our trash is is coming from China, but uh, when we look at things like brands, and uh, we can identify a lot of things that are local products. So it's um, it's our problem as um, as much as it is anyone's problem. Now this is in Lapsap One, and uh, one of the things that uh, we noticed a year ago, and then again last week, Dana and I were on a beach in Lungkui Tan, so um, in the New Territories, and we saw a, a My Little Pony doll um, that we'd actually seen last June. We we, we went to that beach um, last year, and it was so trashed. We hadn't seen anything as bad as, um, well, until we went to Laps at One, um, anything as bad as this beach. And we noticed a lot of things, but there was just the two of us and we were just going for a look. So we left all the trash there. And then when we went for a, a cleanup last week, this pony was still there. So a year later, the some of the trash is still there. So we know that some of it does hang around Hong Kong and unfortunately, some of it does leave Hong Kong as well. So we do see pockets around, like Patrick showed, um, just building up and building up. But we know from some of the islands that it is moving further and further out as well. So where does it go when it floats away? It can end up in the middle of the ocean. And uh, in 2012, I was lucky enough to join a research expedition. We sailed from Japan to Hawaii, 20, 28 days on this yacht and we collected samples of uh, um, microplastics predominantly from the sea surface and we also did visual observations. And the reason we went to the middle of the Pacific was because uh, they have these convergent zones. So these numbers here are where the gyres of the oceans are and a gyre is a slow moving circular current um, of water and basically it collects anything that leaves the shores along the coastlines and you can see, which one's the, um, the dot one? That one. You can see 
how much of a coastline is all around the Pacific. And there's a lot of hot spots. Um, Asia produces a lot of trash. Hong Kong's not the worst one. Um, there's a lot of cities and a lot of countries that, produ that are producing equally, if not more, amounts of trash as Hong Kong. And a lot of this is uh, leaving the shores and uh, moving towards the middle of the oceans. And it does this because plastic doesn't break down easily and it floats and it moves and it doesn't often stay in one place. So what does, what does the middle of the ocean look like? We saw a lot of uh, big items. Um, we saw toothbrushes, we saw bottle caps, we saw plastic water bottles, we saw a lot of big fishing floats, but we also saw a lot of little things as well. This is actually one of the samples that uh, we took using a fine um, mesh net um, to scoop the sea surface. That black thing in the middle is part of a plastic bag. But what, um, what is most shocking was the amount of plastics that we found in each of the trawl. Basically from the whole, uh, whole uh, 28 days, every trawl that we took from Japan to Hawaii contained particles of plastic. And it's these particles because it's breaking down in the sun and because of the waves and things like that. So whilst there's the big pieces, there's also the, the really small pieces as well. So it's, it's a shame that what we're doing on land has a very big impact not just in the Pacific, but all around the planet now. Our trash is moving everywhere. Now I've got this poster out the front there, so you can have a more detailed look. But uh, this was on Monday when we went out to a beach um, uh, near an island um, called Beaufort Island, and we collected um, some of the rubbish that was on the beach. And I just wanted to give you an idea of the breakdown time. So. Um, Plastic is meant to last. That's, it's a, a durable product. Um, you want to um, use it for things that, are, that you want to last for a very long time. But more often than not now, we're using plastic for things that we're using once um, or for a short time. So things like our plastic shopping bags, um, wherever it is, um, 10 to 20... 10 to 20 years for a shopping bag to break down, um, 450 years potentially for a plastic bottle. This is not exact science. Um, it depends a lot on the conditions, but um, if you've had uh, things in the sunlight in your um, in your house, you'll notice that they break down quickly. But once it gets into the water, um, it's cold. It's, uh, if the object is sinking, it's dark, it doesn't break down quickly at all. So we know that the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea is covered in plastic water bottles. They filmed um, the bottom of the sea and uh, you know this is a, a, a tragic end to some of the products that we're using on the land. So what are the problems? Patrick touched on them a little bit. This is a hermit crab from Taiwan and uh, it's using a party popper as its house. And it might seem funny or cute or um, you know, convenient for a crab to use that as at home. It looks like it's, it's an effective home. But uh, what happens with these crabs, they're designed to go into shells. So their stomach can often be exposed by not being inside of the shell. And this is not healthy for the crab. It means they're um, prone to injury. Um, so. Ideally, they want shells to live in, and unfortunately, more often than not, um, there's more plastic than shells on the beach. Um, we've seen crabs in bottle caps and, and plastic tubes and all sorts of things, so it's becoming a, more, a, a bigger problem. In Hong Kong, our pink dolphins are getting entangled in trash. So this is a rope um, from a, attached to a fishing net. So all different types of, uh, of plastic. A very famous image, um, possibly some of you have already seen. This is an albatross chick from Midway Island. And uh, Midway Island is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, so thousands of kilometers from anywhere. Nobody lives on Midway Island. And uh, it's the nesting and breeding ground of albatross. And what happens is the albatross go out and feed on the surface of the water and they scoop up whatever is there. And we know that there's a lot of floating plastics there. They bring all this plastic back and they're feeding their chicks. So um, 
thousands and thousands and thousands of birds there are dying because of this plastic. It's filling up their stomachs. They can't uh, absorb any food. Um, very, very lucky to have Joe here today um, with, uh, with a sample that uh, you know, brings, brings you to tears. This is actually the stomach contents of an albatross. So you can see this has all floated across the ocean and been ingested by birds. Coming back again to Hong Kong, a hawksbill turtle was rescued and rehabilitated by AFCD and uh, fortunately released back into the water, although I'm not sure if that's fortunate or not. This was the stomach contents that was removed, so plastic cable ties, bits of rubber, all sorts of things are being ingested by, by the turtles. Estimates now of a third of uh, um, all sea turtles will ingest plastic over their lifespan. And you can see how easy it is. Down the bottom here, um, jellyfish, what turtles eat, and next to it, a balloon. So the plastic in the water, when it breaks down, um, sometimes it can really mimic the food source of many of the animals. So you can see, you know, turtles, fish, they don't know about plastic, they only know about food. So anything that's in the water floating is, is a food source for them. So what about us? How, how is this affecting us? When I was younger, my sisters and I used to go to the beach and uh, we would uh, have fun, we'd build sand castles, we'd throw jellyfish at each other, we'd, uh, we wouldn't see any plastic rubbish on the beach. My kids, sitting there, unfortunately have probably been to about 200 beach cleanups. Um, and their life, their experience now on beaches is cleaning up rubbish. And it's really sad that in one generation we've gone from seashells to bottle caps. And hopefully, if we um, if we can improve things, we can switch that back again. Oh. This is a. Um, video from uh, Plymouth University Marine Lab and uh, taken under the microscope using fluorescent polystyrene microbeads similar to this sort of size here. Um, the marine creatures in there are plankton, so base of the food chain. So just... Um, yep. You can watch them ingest, ingest this. Some of it does pass through the plankton, but some of it does stay in 
there as well, and it's typical of any of the plastic that's ingested in, in the marine animals. So that was the base of the food chain, moving up a bit higher. Um, this fish here is from the middle of the Pacific Ocean and uh, caught for lunch by a friend of mine. When he cut it open, inside was all the plastic particles and not particularly appealing, um, even when you're really, really hungry. Um, the bottom picture is a toothpaste tube found on Sheko Beach and you'll notice, especially here, you can see all the teeth marks and uh, increasingly on our beach cleanups that we do, we're finding more and more of uh, these items here that have holes in them. And it's not just soft plastics, you know, it's hard plastics as well. A lot of the fish out there have very strong teeth, so anything they try and eat. There's more examples on the table as well, if you want to have a look. So with the with the pollutants that Patrick mentioned, um, our sea water does contain chemical pollutants and uh, what happens with these chemicals is they like to bond with oily substances and plastic is something that they love to bond to so that the chemicals don't want to stay in the water. Um, they will attach to the plastic and they'll, they'll stick on the surface and some, uh, I, some bits of plastic have concentrations of chemicals like DDT or PCBs, um, flame retardants or pesticides a million times more concentrated than the surrounding seawater, so like little poison pills in the water. And what happens when they get ingested, um, some of these chemicals do leach off into the tissues of um, the fish, nice oily tissues as well. So the chemicals are sticking, the plastic might pass through or it might stay in the fish, but um, some of the chemicals will pass through into the tissues as well and uh, accumulate um, or bioaccumulate up the food chain. And uh, studies have shown that uh, some of these chemicals um, do cause cancer, they cause heart disease, they cause all sorts of problems, um, genetic problems and, uh, and affect our um, reproduction ability. So this is chemicals that we don't want in our food chain. So what can we do about it? I know it's very depressing and uh, it seems like a huge global problem that, uh, that we're all part of and that we can't do anything about. But actually, um, there's a lot of people all around the world that are doing things and uh, we need more people to be aware of these problems and aware of the solutions. And a lot of the solutions are things that we can take on ourselves and, uh, and when we all start doing them, we can have a big impact. It's like, if we're all using a lot of plastic, we're going to have a big impact. If we all stop using a lot of impact, plastic, we'll have an even bigger impact. So we need to look at ourselves. We need to look at what we're doing and try and reduce as much as possible. Um, we've, uh, we've all heard of the reduce, reuse, recycle mantra that's taught, but uh, reduce is really, really important. Um, and it's becoming more and more difficult because so many more things are packaging plastic and so many things that used to not be like boxes of matches. I don't know if anybody's tried to find a box of match matches lately. I tried to find one when we went camping over Easter. Couldn't. They just did not sell them. The supermarkets don't sell them. 7-Elevens don't sell them. Um, could not find it until Patrick told me where to go. But uh, it shouldn't be that hard. Um, it shouldn't be that you have to buy a plastic cigarette lighter um, that you're then likely to throw away. Um, but this is the direction that we're moving. So I've got 40 boxes of matches now, so if anyone needs them, <laughs> um, come and see me. But uh, look, at, uh, look at what you can do. Um, look at the things that you can change. So bringing your own bag, carrying a reusable water bottle, um, finding alternatives um, for, for the plastic items in your life. And it's, um, you know, it takes time and it's uh, often difficult. And I was down in the cafe just before this talk and I said to the guy, can I have an iced coffee to stay in without a straw, please? So he gave me a plastic cup with a straw. So, you know, you can try and, uh, and it's a difficult road. Um, sometimes 
you do better than other times, but it's just, it's a path that we have to go on. And be an advocate. Tell everybody what you're doing and why you're doing it. And uh, use your voice on social media. Write letters, um, sign petitions. Um, speak to the government where you can and try and encourage them to, to make changes. Um, this, is, uh, this is one of the most powerful things. My kids like sushi and I used to buy sushi all the time and it used to um, drive me nuts. I used to try and bring my own container so they would fill it up um, instead of getting the, the plastic containers. But on the days when, um, when I had to buy it, the plastic grass, why do they have to put that in? And I said to the supermarket manager, is this necessary? Um, you could save money by not putting this piece of grass in that, that is not needed. And it's like, oh yeah. So then the next day, the sushi grass was taken out of the plastic containers and that was just one conversation, one question, and then the change has happened. So you never know what effect you can have just by talking to somebody. So sometimes it's as simple as that and you can make a big difference. Legislation changes. Now, Hong Kong's on a on a good path at the moment, a lot better than it has been um, previously. Um, the plastic shopping bag levy has just been extended, so now it's mostly um, 50 cents for a shopping bag in most of the places. Um, but there needs to be more um, to, uh, to have a bigger effect um, on our beaches. We have noticed that since the levy was introduced a few years ago, the bags that were included in the levy initially, we didn't see them as frequently on the beaches as we did the other bags. So hopefully we'll continue to see this trend on, on the rubbish um, washing up. Um, one of the biggest problems, um, problem items on the beaches is plastic water bottles. We see them by the thousands. Um, interestingly, um, most of them have the caps on. Um, the ones that don't have the caps sink to the bottom. So we know that there's a lot more out there than what we're seeing on the beaches. Now, Australia did a, um, or has had on, in one state legislation on uh, drink bottles, so including plastic water bottles. So they have a refund deposit. And uh, a couple of years ago, the CSIRO, the science research group in Australia, did a study along the whole of the Australian coastline, took two or three years to do this. And um, they looked at all the trash and where it was building up. And uh, in South Australia, where they have this refund deposit, um, there was a threefold decrease in the amount of plastic water bottles that were on the beach because they have this levy. So resources are collected and there's less rubbish coming in. So this is something that Hong Kong um, should be moving towards. So we can increase the recycling, increase jobs, um, and get a lot more litter off the beach. It seems like a simple, simple change. So I know that's something that we'll be pushing for when we can. Um, also with the eco-responsibility ordinance, um, things like facial scrubs. They have plastic particles in them so frequently these days. And uh, to get maybe a labelling on the bottle so people know if they're going to be scrubbing their face with plastic or if they're going to be using natural um, alternatives. This is an initiative that the government could do um, and uh, help reduce the, the amount of plastic microbeads that are flowing through our sewage systems and out to sea. So you've seen the effects at the base of the food chain for this plastic. So even though it's not a visible form, it's not going to be seen on LAPSAP1, um, it is still a problem that's, uh, that's controllable. And that's um, all I have to say, but uh, I want you to know that even though we're all part of this problem, this big global problem, we're all part of the solution as well. So use your voice, um, show some action and spread the word as much as you can. And I know that, uh, that we'll be turning the tide on this wave of plastic pollution. Thank you.
Does anyone have any questions? Anything to say? Song to sing? Dana? Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Mandy Barker, photographic artist from England, UK. Um, and I'm going to talk about, I thought it would be useful to see sort of the inspiration and how my work started before I got to the final images, um, which have been um, displayed next door as a finalist for the Wingmasters Award. Um, this is where I've traveled from to come to Hong Kong. And also the red dots here show the areas around the world where I've collected marine plastic debris for my work. So as you can see, it represents you know, a global representation. Uh, basically, um, my interest in the sea and the coastline stems from my childhood when I used to sort of wander the beaches and collect natural objects like shells and driftwood and things like that. And as the years went on, um, I began to see more man-made objects and especially plastics littering the beaches. Uh, here are some examples of debris in the UK. So as you can see, um, you know, it's a global problem, not just here in Hong Kong. So my first project began with single objects that I collected from the beach. Um, and I had to find a way of trying to make them uh, interesting to people, because when I showed them pictures that you've just seen, um, people didn't seem to be interested. They'd, they'd seen that before, you know, they'd seen sort of pollution on the beach. And although they thought it was a problem, it didn't, they didn't really remember it. So I decided to collect single items and photograph them on a black background to take them out of context and try and give them more interest. So this first project was called Indefinite. Uh, and the objects that I began to collect, as you can see here, a plastic bag, seemed to take on um, the look of the sea creatures themselves that the plastic was affecting. Um, maybe you could see an octopus here. Um, these are PVC fishermen's gloves um, that take 30 years to decompose. And 450 years, this is a base of a bottle that maybe looks a bit like a fish head. Um, so I created a book of 10 images and um, at the back of the book, I gave a more detailed description as to what the um, materials represented and what effect they had on the wildlife. So initially it was just a timeline um, sort of describing how many years each one takes to decompose. The final um, material that I chose was polystyrene and I gave that the title of indefinite because um, this material never breaks down. It breaks down into smaller pieces but it never actually goes away. So this formed the title of the book. Um, you've seen this uh, image before by Chris Jordan on the right hand side. When I saw this image, um, I just felt it, the issue was something I just couldn't turn away from and I had to represent through photography. Um, as I began to do more research into materials in the sea, I began to find out that there were large areas of plastic existing in the five gyres. Um, this sort of mass accumulation of plastics was something I wanted to expand from after doing uh, the project of a single image. So how to photograph um, kind of this mass accumulation? Um, in this case, I collected uh, single-use plastic cups and photographed the small particles of the plastic cups on one layer, medium-sized um, middle layer, and then larger pieces on the top. And I quite like the way that when I put the layers together, they form this kind of random, um, almost suspension, so they look like they were kind of floating about in the sea. So this formed the basis um, of my images for soup. Um, I decided to call it soup because this is a description giving to, given to suspended plastics in the sea. And also combined with the grid reference um, is a specific area in the North Pacific where uh, there's a mass accumulation of plastics. Uh, this is one of the images from the series. Um, it's called Turtle Soup and it represents turtles that fell off a container ship in 1991 uh, off the coastline of Japan and their children's plastic bath toys that all floated to the surface and um, followed currents around the world. So although this was an accidental um, accumulation of plastic in the sea, I wanted to represent um, how it may have appeared of these 28,000 plus um, plastic toys. And this is a detail of that image. Um, 
So I wanted to create this kind of swirling mass and how it would appear in the sea. Uh, this image is soup translucent. Uh, it's all translucent objects that I found in the sea. Basically, it's mainly food packaging, um, water bottles, things like that, where the print has actually faded away or come off as time spent in the sea. Uh, there's a helium balloon at the bottom, which is a common problem uh, in all countries. Um, a sort of food packaging, again, as I say, I think is mainly the um, dominant thing in this one. Um, this is called bird's nest soup. Um, this is fishing line that has rolled back and forth with the tides and created these kind of nest-like balls, almost looking a bit like a swarm of jellyfish or something similar. Um, they've also collected uh, debris in their path as they've rolled um, backwards and forwards. This image is soup refused. Um, this, this plastic was collected on a beach in Greece. Uh, this particular beach um, was occupied by goats that used to walk up and down the beach and sort of feed on the plastic at the water's edge. So all these pieces of plastic have actually been chewed and spat out by the goats, so they're all kind of gnarled. Uh, I thought it was quite ironic that I actually found a tube of toothpaste on that beach, along with goat's teeth. If you follow up high, you can see there were lots of teeth, so I kind of like that irony. Um, the final image in this series is quite different to the first ten, um, relating back to the um, plastics that were found in the stomach of the albatross chick. This is a compact arrangement of 500 plus pieces that were found in the stomach of an albatross chick and it's based on an image by Susan Middleton who took this photograph. Um, so what I've done in my previous projects is represent um, what I think exists out in the North Pacific Gyre, but I'd never actually been there myself. So when um, I got the opportunity to join um, a scientific expedition along with Tracy, as she's mentioned earlier, um, I just felt it was something I had to be on. I wanted to see for myself what existed in the North Pacific. Um, so this is a sample of um, one of the trawls we did while we are on the North Pacific essentially sieving the surface to see um, what was literally on the surface, nothing deeper. Um, and it was shocking to find nurdles, microplastic particles, plastic fibres, all manner of things. Um, whilst I was on the voyage, I photographed every single piece of plastic that was brought aboard uh, over a period of a month. And this formed my project Shoal. Um, Basically, all the plastics photographed, as you can see here, there's pieces of um, plastic from a Japanese house. There's buckets, household objects. There's a lot of fishing gear where the boats had been um, snapped from their moorings during the tsunami. Um, I tried to create sort of shoals that represented the fish that would be existing in the North Pacific and which these plastics may in turn affect. This image is of uh, a child's toy gun. It had the imprint of Made in Japan on it, and it was found on the beach in the Fukushima prefecture in Japan. Um, I wanted to reproduce a gun in this way to represent the amount of lives lost in the tsunami, and particularly children, because it was a child's toy gun. Um, I wanted to include this project penalty because um, this is quite important because it is a collaboration with public from around the world. Um, via social media, I asked people to send me a football or soccer ball, marine debris um, from the beach where they lived or what, that they'd seen in the water. And um, I got an amazing response. Um, I got 769 footballs sent to me from around the world. And I made four images, one which was the world, uh, one was Europe, one the UK, and one was just from one man, which um, he collected 228 balls, uh, which I had to go and pick up from Scotland in a van. <laughs> uh, and when I received all the footballs, I photographed them at home in my studio. So it was a, a massive project, because I quite underestimated the size of a football and the storage. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so moving on to Hong Kong soup, of which the, the series are exhibited uh, next door here. Um, basically, all the plastics in this series are plastics that I've collected from over 30 different beaches in Hong Kong. Um, and here are some of the beaches um, that I've collected them from. As with all my images, um, I have a sketchbook, I write down my ideas. Before I come up with um, a composition, I think of um, what it might be and just generally collect notes and ideas. 
Um, this is the first typical sort of notebook page where I'm kind of thinking of where waste is coming from. Uh, a collection of uh, plastic tea bottles, a um, collection of children's ice pop wrappers, uh, tickets I might find on the beach and things like that that just help me come up with an idea. Um, this sketchbook page typically relates to the image polystyrene. Um, basically, it's about movement of waste in Hong Kong, um, about how the polystyrene floats on the water surface and the different currents move it about. So this inspired uh, the final image here, which is polystyrene. This is based on 52 tonnes of polystyrene dining ware that goes into landfill every day in Hong Kong. And these statistics were from 2012, so how that's increased since then, um, I wouldn't like to think. Um, this ideas page is based on my lighter's image. Uh, I found a lighter on the beach which had a dolphin on it. Um, and thinking of the pink dolphins here, the in, sort of endangered species, um, I also found lighters with a dog and a panda on, and I thought this was kind of really ironic that we were finding sort of natural uh, creatures and animals printed or um, embossed onto sort of plastic man-made lighters. So I thought this was something I would like to highlight. So I created a, a kind of an illusion of a pod of dolphins for the composition of the image. Uh, and I highlighted the panda lighter um, to make it turn away from the rest of the group as if it was turning its back on uh, man's overconsumption of plastic. This image is um, children's ice pops, popsicle wrappers, that I'm sure if you're in Hong Kong you see uh, much of on the beaches, because I've seen many. Um, obviously the manufacturers in this case are appealing to children to attract them to buy the product. Whilst I was collecting these from the beaches, um, I found syringes at the same time on the beach. Um, and I found this particularly shocking. This is a detail from the image. Uh, so I wanted to include um, the aspects of sort of the children's product with the syringes and show this kind of disparity between um, these two extremes. This image is called packet soup and it refers to um, all sort of food packaging, gift packaging that I found on the beaches in Hong Kong. Um, it shows takeaway sort of food items next to bottles of bleach. So I wanted to highlight um, hazardous waste next to kind of common um, food packaging which we would eat from. Um, I wanted to sort of give some emphasis to the mobile phone, um, a confectionery packet which hopefully will make you think about uh, communication and communicating the problem. This sketchbook page is for Lotus Garden. Um, this was uh, an image that was based on um, traditional Japanese uh, sorry, Chinese paintings, um, and also the wake um, after I'd been to a particular beach to collect the plastics, um, it left behind this kind of um, shape of perspective which I wanted to um, enhance in the image. All these flowers were collected from beaches in Hong Kong, and obviously they wouldn't be at the same flowering time um, if they were natural objects because um, you know, you don't get holly and lotus and rose and carnation flowering all at the same time. So in a way, this, this shows a kind of an unease of um, things existing um, at the same flowering time, but also that they shouldn't be in the sea. Um, just touching again on the nurdle spill um, that has already been mentioned by Patrick and Tracy. Um, the container ship with the sacks of nurdles that littered the beaches, I felt was something that needed to be highlighted in an image. Um, so six different samples were collected from six different beaches to relate to the six containers that um, spilled their load. And my idea for this is based on the night sky um, in Hong Kong that particular evening after the nurdle spill uh, on the left hand side. This was a picture of the night sky in Hong Kong and I wanted to recreate um, that feeling almost as a reflection, as if the sky was kind of reflecting the nurdles that would be submerged in the water on that particular day. And this is the final image. So it's representing 150 tonnes of nurdles in the sea. The final image um, is called Transform. 
And this I particularly wanted um, to relate to the children, the younger generation in Hong Kong. I wanted them to think about what happens to their toys when they've finished playing with them. Um, you know, how does their transformer, their action man end up in the sea? Uh, and make, just make them think and think of some sort of connection. Um, so hopefully that will make them think. Um, so laps at one. Um, I visited that last weekend. Um, seen these pictures before and also the location. Um, what was particularly interesting to me was um, the fact that polystyrene and plastic bottles were the two most common things on this beach. And I found this particularly ironic that the, the polystyrene had broken down into small pieces and actually found its way into the plastic bottles. Uh, so for me, that is a, a representation of the main problem there at the moment. Um, this is another example of polystyrene, just a random shot, as you can see there, printer ink cartridge, um, another panda lighter, uh, soap dispenser. What I found particularly alarming uh, was the amount of shoes and flip-flops that are on Lapsat Wan Beach and on other beaches in Hong Kong. Um, this is an example that I've seen, this isn't from Lapsat Wan, but this is from last week when I went with a friend to a beach in South Lantau and we found 247 shoes in half an hour, just the two of us. And this is just a sample of the blue ones that we found. Lapsat one has far more than this, um, so this is just uh, an example. Um, but more alarming to me is the actual material, the industrial waste that's been left over from the flip-flops and the soles of the, soles of the shoes. Um, here has been bundled up, I would think, for fishermen to use as a float, um, but there are several, several lots of pieces there. Um, this is another example of that. Uh, this is quite a large piece of foam and here I am photographing it in, on location there. Um, I quite like the idea of the way um, this kind of waste piece of material looks a bit like a skeleton, it looks a bit like a fishbone um, and that for me gives a kind of metaphor of death and um, you know uh, death of sea creatures. So I think that might be an idea that I'll develop. Um, so looking at a few different pieces, because there's many, many different pieces, um, this, these are just initial records for me, me to uh, put in my sketchbook and perhaps come up with a final image from. Um, so I'd just like to end with um, my suitcase. often looks like this when I've visited a, a location and I need to take things back to photograph. Uh, not this time, I'd hasten to add. But, uh, and I'd just like to leave you with, um, photography is not what you see, but it's what you make others see. Um, and if my work can raise awareness um, about the issue of marine plastic debris, then I'll have achieved my aim. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to know a bit more about the Lapsat One that uh, you've, you've been to. I'd love to visit myself. Uh, we had the same, similar looking beach on Lama, um, and several years ago in one beach cleanup, we picked up 900 plastic bottles from there. Um, and I'm just wondering about access to that particular place uh, in terms of if, if people did want to go and make a dent in it or get to it? Do they have to get there by sea? Is there a land access? Uh, and how long and how difficult would that be if people wanted to go and, and see that? Okay, uh, so actually this beach, as I mentioned before, is not too accessible because um, you, need to, uh, you need to drive. Uh, usually people drive along the Capdagula Road, but that one is restricted. So you need to have permit to enter the Capdagora Road. If not, you need to uh, walk from Sheko Road mm -hmm. all the way to um, Cap at the tip of Cap Capdagora, which takes you around 45 minutes. And um, the way from the, from, the, uh, vehicle, from, from the road down to the beach um, is now a construction uh, site. So you need to, yeah, you need to go there during the weekend when, when the construction workers are not working. If not, they will just stop you. 
at the entrance. Or alternatively, um, we have just nearly um, trimmed uh, away down to the beach, which was a, a which was a, a good way before, but uh, because there were uh, not many people visiting there, so all the weeds uh, grow back, and we just yeah just tidy up the way. So if you, if you would like to go, how can I can show you? And yeah. and why is it is who called it Lapsat Wan and why is it called Lapsat Wan? Because if you call something Lapsat Wan, there's yeah. an expectation that it is Lapsap or rubbish. Uh, whereas if you if it's called you know Pretty Bay, uh, <laughs> you know or something something a bit more that that gives hope that it actually this isn't what is normal and what it should be is something else. Does it have an original name or or? You know, is there a, an idea that it could be called something which would indicate what it should look like if all that Lapsat wasn't there? Well, as far as I know, Lapsat One has only one name, which is Lapsat One. <laughs> and um, but there were several different Lapsat One before, mm -hmm. which I showed you uh, in the second slide of mine. Um, those um, four sites were actually um, garbage dumping sites. At the beach, but um, for for Lapsat One at Cap Dagrera, um, there were two versions. Somebody said that it was also a dumping site before, but somebody also said it is mainly because Just of the the wind, the which yeah. blows all the trash on mm -hmm. on shore. And I tend to believe that it's only because it it is uh, blown yeah. from the sea because. Mm -hmm. It is too remote, mm -hmm. and um, the wave is too strong. There is no point for people to dump there, and mm -hmm. there is high possibility that they will be blown away again. Mm -hmm. um, and for the other four sites that I mentioned to you, like uh, Saito Wan, Junk Bay, they are in a bay area, yeah. which are more Accessible. safer for yeah. the litter. Yeah. yeah. Coming up, uh, we have, uh, we're very honored to have uh, Joe Ruxton, who's the co-founder of Plastic Oceans here today, all the way from the UK, um, to share with us Plastic Oceans and overview and solution. So uh, please uh, hang on for five minutes while we set up uh, her presentation. Thank you.